Star Trek books. They've been around for decades. Join us, the Trek ladies, Kavora and Jen, as we discuss the novels one at a time. Welcome to the Ladies Trek Library. Hello, we're back with Ladies Trek Library. And this is Kavora, and I'm here with Jen. Hi, Jen. Hey, Kavora. Hey, listeners. I'm happy to be back talking about another Star Trek book. So this time we have The Rift, and this is by Peter David. It's an original series novel. And let me see. Just make sure. I want to see what the date. The date, copyright 1991 for this. And I'll read what's on the back. Every 33 years, a rift in space connects the Federation with a mysterious race called the Caligar, who live on a planet hundreds of light years away, much too far to travel in a starship. Captain Kirk and the USS Enterprise are dispatched to transport a Federation delegation of diplomats, scholars, and scientists who will travel to Caligar directly during the brief period of time that the rift will be open. Mr. Spock leads the Federation party as they travel by shuttle through the rift as a group of the aliens arrive in Federation space. The meetings go smoothly until the Caligar takes Spock's party hostage, and Kirk discovers that the aliens are keeping a deadly secret. With angry Tellarite and Andorian fleets ready to attack the Caligar, Kirk must save Spock and the others before war breaks out and the rift closes for another 50 years. Okay, so there's one, like a glaring mistake on this. It starts out by saying every 33 years, and then that last sentence says 50 years. (laughs) 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 But it actually was 33, like 0.4 years in the book. Um, And now as I was reading it, I just noticed they, they misspelled Andorian. They spelled it in Dory Yane, A-I-N, but, oh, well, anyway. <laughs> oh, A-I-N instead of A-N. Yeah, yes. Yeah, you know, I've seen it both ways. So maybe, you know, early on, well, this wasn't too early a book. This was 91, but maybe, you know, there wasn't a lot of consensus or it could be. Because I've seen, um, I don't know what book it is that I have. It might be the Stellar Cartography but uh-huh. I have scenes where the planet is called Andor and not Andoria. It, so it then, is, yeah. Yeah, so then, and then, but I think I've seen Andoria too, so I don't know. Okay, that's interesting. Well, it, I think it should be Andorian just from the way they pronounce it. And that they do say that like they're, they're on a moon of Andor. Oh, oh yeah, and, and, if I, and if I've ever seen it misspelled before, I probably just never noticed it. That's one of the hard things to notice I think <laughs> yeah but anyway so getting to the book so what what did you think or, or do you want uh, let's see do you want to start by asking me we'll go that way all right well actually I thought we could start by talking about the cover oh, okay um, yeah yeah I just thought of that now actually it wasn't when I was thinking about questions I kind of don't think about the cover because I read it on Kindle so I, I don't have a cover I mean I do oh, but yeah it's like a black and white Kindle and so it doesn't you know I wasn't really looking at the artwork um, but now that I'm looking at it because I don't have the book it's an interesting cover because it has uh, a Captain Kirk wearing like the you know, Wrath of Khan uh, uniform, and it is set, you know, later in his career. But then the Spock that's on the cover looks like a very young Spock, like from season one, although he's wearing blue. Um, but it's not the blue of season one, but it's kind of, I don't know. It's actually from, it, it is what he wore in the cage under under Pike. If you go back and watch that episode, Oh, they, on the original series, sense because part of the book takes place under Pike, and right. so it's the cover has Kirk from you know the present day, I guess you could say, because the novel takes place thirty, it, you know, two different time frames, thirty three years apart. So I guess that's duh, didn't even occur to me. That's Spock in the first part of the book, which takes place under Captain Pike, and then Kirk from the later part of the book. Yeah, that that's what they're doing. Yeah. 
but but what I mean, what I read about this that I, that I didn't really notice is, is that Kirk's uniform. He has the rank of admiral, and he's really a captain in this book because the book is when he got was after he was bumped back down to being captain of the Enterprise. So so there is that, and and the picture of the city behind them it looks like it's the same city that was used in Wink of an Eye, but in the book it's I know it's supposed to represent uh, the new planet or the world net that they that they talk about in the book. Interesting that it's the same city from Wink of an Eye. Yeah, it doesn't look too much like um, how the world net was described. Um, but, you know, yeah, it, the it's cover just work, one, artwork yeah. doesn't yeah, match at all. So <laughs> Yeah, it's just one place instead of being like the whole world net or something. Yeah. Okay, well, we'll now that we've discussed the cover, we'll get into <laughs> the... Um, uh, to the book itself. Now that, you know, thinking back, uh, maybe if I had a copy of the book and I was looking at the cover and I had thought about, oh yeah, that's a young Spike. It would have been include, uh, young Spike, young Spock. Spock. <laughs> merging that with Captain Pike here. Um, it would have clued me in that uh, you know, were going to see some early Spock, but I didn't have any clue because Captain Kirk's on the cover. So I'm reading it and, and uh, the book starts out and it's the Enterprise under Captain Pike. And actually for, I don't know, probably close to maybe 40% through the book, it's it's all Captain Pike. And I'm thinking, well, where's Captain Kirk? He's on the cover. <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. At first, you, yeah, it does kind of fool you, I guess. <laughs> um, so were you surprised to see Captain Pike in the story, too? And what did you think about how Peter David handled his character? Um, you know, I actually was surprised to see Pike, even though I... I, I read this book a long time ago, but I had forgotten about that the, for the, the first few chapters actually have Pike and take place during that era. So, yeah, that was um, a pleasant surprise for me, too. And and I do like the way his character is in this book. Um, it, it's different. I th well, I think it's, it's it's pretty much an extension of how he was on when we did see him on the original series. It's different from the way he's handled on Strange New Worlds. I don't know if you've seen that yet, but I have not seen Strange New Worlds, but I have seen um, Pike on Discovery, and so I know what Anthony oh, yeah. Pike is like. Um, and I agree, it is a very different. Uh, than than Anson Mount's Captain Pike, um, and it's hard to say, you know, what the original series Pike was going to be like because we, you know, we really didn't see him in it for very long. So just from one episode, you can't pull too much there. Um, I thought, though, but I have read, you know, even before we had Discovery and Strange New Worlds, there were some novels that had Captain Pike in them, and I felt like this Captain Pike was actually pretty different than the Captain Pikes that I'd read about in some of the novels and, and certainly very different from Anson Mount's Captain Pike. Um, he seemed more um, stiff, um, someone who just was very uh, formal and um, didn't really interact with his crew on a social or friendly level. He sort of had this distance, like he's above, um, you know, not that he was arrogant, but um, just a more formal, distant intellectual. Um, so it was interesting um, to see that because I just haven't ever read a depiction of Captain Pike like that and hadn't really seen one on screen. Um, so it was kind of in a way like reading about a different Captain Pike, um, a different character. And, and uh, Peter David does spend a lot of time talking about how this Captain Pike always has this distance between himself and the rest of the crew, even the officers. And, and he never sort of fraternizes with them. Um, and when he does try to fraternize with them, he doesn't, he's not very successful because he's just uh, kind of forcing it. Did you notice that? I did. Yeah. He did seem more formal in this one. I, I kind of did see it more as an extension of what he, he what he was when he was um when he was in that episode the cage um and and the book does mention it like uh later on when when Commodore Tyler is talking to to Kirk and he does say that um that Pike ran a much tighter ship than Kirk seems to run and that kind of thing so I do think 
so yeah, he was more formal in this book, and it and it did seem to be intentional because I think he was on on in that episode, even though you're right, he didn't seem to be that way in other books. And on Strange New Worlds, it it has been mentioned, and on Discovery, that Pike is is different, and and some people have explained it well. That's probably because we saw him with, with Vina, and this this book and on Star Trek that is on now takes place after. The episode with Vina, so maybe Pike became a little more loose after after that, after going through that experience, falling in love and all of that. I mean, maybe you know it could be explained that way. But yeah, he, yeah. So he, but he was more formal in this, and I think that Peter David just drew it from from what we saw in the episode. Yeah, and um, speaking of Vina, she does make. Uh, an appearance, not exactly, but uh, sort of in Pike's, um, I don't know if we call it a dream, but he has a, they have an experience when they go through the rift where he um, envisions her. So you, you know that he's still thinking about her. Um, but what did you think also about the other characters on, on the, uh, on Pike's Enterprise? So we have Spock is there and Uhura and, um, you know, some and Chekhov is there too. Um, do you think they were uh, true to character? I think um, Spock was. I mean, for for the others, it's it's harder to say because they weren't really they weren't there as much. But I like the way the way he handled Spock uh, back then under Pike, and and of course, and number one, the female first officer. So, so it's showing how Spock. Um, learned a lot from number one because we we know we, you know we know now through through history from reading this is that um is that number one's character back then was the emotionless one spock had more emotion back then and then when they decided to drop number one when nbc was told to drop number one spock's character his his emotion uh those characteristics were taken over and put uh the characters from number one were put into spock so that is the reason that Spock became the emotionless one later. So anyway, so anyway, this this book kind of portrays Spock as learning from number one. Like she said the word fascinating and Spock thought, oh, that's an interesting word. I want to start using that and things like that. So I do like the way you, the way you, you can tell Spock's character was developing in this in this story, the way he learned from number one. That's uh, mostly what I took from from the characters of that era. Yeah, they didn't have too much of Uhura or Sulu or um, Chekhov in there. Um, Scotty a little bit more. Um, but yeah, I enjoyed number one in here. And, and I did catch on to that, that, uh, you know, Peter David writes it in that Spock uh, first thinks about the phrase fascinating because he hears it from number one and decides, oh, yeah, you know what, that's a good, good phrase. I'm going to use that. And he starts saying mm-hmm. it. And I, I really enjoy the scenes between number one and Spock when they're working together on a computer program. And, um, you know, you get to hear kind of some of Spock's feelings about um, number one and how he thinks, you know, for a human, she's she's all right, you know, because she's he recognized she doesn't really have the, uh, you know, she's pretty emotionless for a human. And uh, and she's, you know very good with computers so i almost could see like oh you know if this stayed together i could almost see a romance happening between spock and and uh number one although i uh, probably one-sided because i think you know number one we know uh, had a crush on captain pike but um you know you can see that he really admires her for for you know a human he thinks she's pretty vulcan like so he likes that oh that's an interesting thought though there could have been something between spock and number one <laughs> Excuse me, I am all stuffed up. Um, what about, were you surprised, and what did you think about the return of characters from original series episodes, Ambassador Robert Fox and Dr. Richard Daystrom? Um, that was interesting. It was, um, yeah, again, I, I didn't remember them being in the book from before. It, it was neat. I don't know if it if it was really necessary, like, like bringing one familiar character back is okay, but bringing two characters that were there were guest stars like that i mean 
it, it does kind of seem a little much, but I think they, they both fit into the story well um, as far as what they did. They both uh, sort of had a chance to redeem themselves, and maybe that was what Peter David's um, intention was. Maybe he likes these characters and wanted to to work with them more. So, so, but it is good that Fox was known as this, you know, a very strict person before, and and very set in his ways and argumentative, and and he kind of came through in this book. And Richard Daystrom, who came out of the Ultimate Computer, being depressed and and the book says he went through rehab which we would imagine and and now he's he's still depressed but he also had had a chance to redeem himself in this in this book so i thought it was um it was a good use of those characters even though maybe a little much having both of them in the same book yeah that's really an interesting way to think about it that he kind of they both kind of did redeem themselves um in a way um, because when he brought Ambassador Fox back, I thought, oh, yeah, you know, I didn't like this guy. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he's in the book. Who did like him? <laughs> but, um, he, you know, he did redeem himself. He still was, you know, kind of annoying. But, um, you know, you realize, hey, you know what? We maybe got a bad uh, judgment of him in um, the original series. And maybe there was more to him than what we saw in that one episode. Um, and Richard Daystrom had an interesting you know, part in this, which we'll, I think we'll talk about later. Um, but um, what about the Caligar, the aliens who live on the other side of the rift? Um, and one thing that's interesting to me is, um, you know, this was published in 91. So this, you know, came out before Voyager. But in some ways, I, I felt like, I wonder if, you know, Peter David had any inkling about Voyager happening because he makes several references like, oh, you know, what would happen if their ship got stuck on the other side of this rift and it would take them a lifetime to get back and they'd be their whole, you know, and he it just oh, said yeah. references were like, hmm, <laughs> you know. Um, yeah, well, this book was even before um, before Deep Space Nine, which started in in 93. But the, they mentioned that the the rift in space takes them to the gamma quadrant. So and and so and that was the main quadrant in Deep Space Nine. So that is interesting that this book mentioned that as well. Um, but the the Caligar, um, they they were different as a race. I thought they were interesting. They're they're a new a good creation as far as um their their way of doing things and their the idea of the the world net which they wouldn't mention it first in the book, but I like the idea that they were isolationist and were kind of thinking about about expanding a little more. Um, and now, now the idea about the the incest, like that it's okay for brother and sister to get married, that that was ve- really different, very a very you know like a culture shock to us. But the way it was handled in the book, you could understand it because you you do have to think that well other races yeah they are going to have some customs that are that are taboo to us, and they said that with their genetics, it's it's something that's okay they can have children and wouldn't the children wouldn't be defective or anything. Um, so so it is an interesting idea, a new a new Star Trek type of concept to think about, and having the world net where all these the they were all on the central computer that was connected, um, very similar to the internet, which wasn't as well known back then when the book was written. So it it was um, it was all an interesting idea. Yeah the the um, the idea of the well, there's two different things. There's the world net, and then there's also like the which is their central like their internet, you could say, and then also their home planet um and the home planet actually reminded me of a um a novel another star trek novel that came out later um by christopher l bennett i'm trying to remember the name of it um but it had a similar um uh, concept where this is like this is a um connection of cities that are above a planet and they're in these like domes um, and they're connected and each um, you know each dome is like a different 
world or city. Um, was it Face of the Unknown? I Something like was. that? Uh, I think it might have been Face of the Unknown. Um, okay, yeah. I'm trying, but it, it, I mean, it wasn't exactly the same, but it, in some ways it was a little similar. I think Christopher L. Bennett, they actually were really like real, real cities living in, you know, that were in these domes, whereas in the Caligar uh, planet or world, they're kind of, um, I don't know, they've kind of mastered uh, mind over matter. So they're not physical cities so much as you create your own experience. So they explained it, for example, when uh, the Enterprise away team goes to the planet and uh, they're sitting in a room and they're all sitting in chairs. And for each person, the chair is different because it knows their thoughts and it knows like what chair is most comfortable to that person. So um, one person would see the room in a totally different way than how the other person would see it, which I thought was really interesting. Um, yeah, that's a very neat concept. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the book uh, does say, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, you go ahead. Um, I mean, it does say that they have more advanced technology than the Federation. So they would have all these things. And they had... They had a holodeck, which, you know, in the time period of of the original series, this is supposed to take place like like after Star Trek V, so not in the time of Next Generation yet. So, so these people had a a holodeck, which w was new to to the people on the Enterprise at the time. That was interesting. Yes, and um, I'll just before we go into that. Yes, I just looked, and it is the face of the unknown. That's the one that I'm thinking of from Christopher Nolan. Oh, yeah. Bennett. And uh, if I had thought of that earlier, I would have looked it up, but it just came to me now that that's what that reminded me of. Um, but I said his was, a, you know, a little different in terms of his, it was a physical world, whereas this is more like a world of your mind. Um, and yes, they do talk about how their technology is in many ways like a holodeck and how um, I think even at the end of the novel that how that technology is going to be happening in the future so it's almost like you know peter david saying yeah like this is what's going to happen because we know already you know next generation had already been on the air for several years so we knew about holodecks so it's like his way of kind of saying yeah this is kind of how like the holodeck got invented was you know ideas from this um but you know they're so they live in these worlds that are above the planet and the reason is because uh generations ago they completely destroyed the planet, uh, the environment, um, with, you know, not taking care of it. So now they're sort of uh, very concerned about, you know, making sure that they don't re repeat the mistakes of the past. Um, but I guess, you know, the world was, it's uninhabitable now. But they have figured out some way to use the planet to fuel these spaces that they're living in above the planet. And then they have this world net, which is where people can go in and um, sort of hook their brain into what you would call the internet and uh, consult with different ideas. And we don't really totally understand it until later on in the book. And I don't know if we want to talk about, well, I think we should probably wait a little to talk about that and the whole concept of thinning and what's really happening in the world net. Um, but what we do have is one of the characters from the early part of the book under Captain Pike is um, Jose Tyler, who was a young officer on under Captain Pike, um, who, when the ship went through the rift the first time, had this very brief uh, encounter with Ekma, um, the daughter of master builder Zio, or Zio, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, um, and fell in love with her. And for 33 years, you know, he's thought about nothing but her. And so now he's back on the Enterprise under Captain Kirk. He's a Commodore and uh, is going to visit her again or hoping to visit her again. Um, and of course, she is now, she comes and she's now the master builder. We learn that her father has passed away and so she has become the master builder. And she wants to leave her planet. And, you know, Tyler thinks this is because she's in love with him and wants to be with him. And maybe there's that is partially true. But we learn there's some other reasons that she's actually 
not really running to him so much as running away from some things. Um, but we will get to that. But I also wanted to talk about the um, Andorian and Tellurite characters. We have uh, a Tellurite character, Shandar, Dorkin, and Andorian Thak, who are uh, representatives from their home worlds who are going to go through the rift uh, with the Enterprise away team. Um, what did you think of them? Um, I like them. Now, now, this was, again, you know, this was at a time before we, we knew that much about Andorians and Tellarites. You know, on Enterprise is when we got to see, when see them more, especially Andorians, we got to see more on Enterprise. So this was written before that. And I like how it, it did say that Andorians are, are warriors. And, and you know, and of course we already knew that that the Tellarites were, that they were argumentative, which we saw in the original series. But the way these, these two characters always went at it in the book, it, it was very entertaining. I thought it was funny, you know, like a Kirk and Spock thing, the way they would just argue each, with each other all the time. And then um, in the end, it turned out that they did seem to have a lot of respect for each other. I mean, and I like that it, that it turned out that way, that they really didn't hate each other. They really had a lot of respect. They just sort of, they were doing the, the arguing thing as sort of, well, that was just their way of, of communicating with each other. It's like they expected it. I think those two races probably always did that with each other. Yeah. Oh, and, and one other thing too, the Andorians, the, the book said something like the Andorians respected Vulcans, which was interesting because we know of how things turn out on, on Enterprise that the Vulcans and Andorians used to hate each other. But then I think that all, you know, went away after a few, you know, hundred years or so after the time of Enterprise. But it was just funny that that was in the book too. Yeah, I you know. I didn't think about that, but he mentioned that. Yeah, and of course, Enterprise hadn't come out at that time. So, yeah, it was really, you know, a lot of the earlier novels didn't have too much of the Andorians um, or the Tellarites in them, and you know, we saw a lot of the Andorians on Enterprise, but not really the Tellarites. Um, so this was interesting to see these two characters and they, you know, they behaved uh, very much like they did um, on the original series. Um, and I thought it was entertaining and they were, they were both, I thought pretty well written. And, um, you know, one thing that I wasn't necessarily expecting is, um, you know, Peter David has this certain style for his humor and, um, you know, some people really love it and, you know, they've read all of his Star Trek novels. Um, and I don't always, his humor isn't always something that I get, or maybe it's not that I don't get it, but it's just not my style. So sometimes I've read his books and I'm like, yeah, you know, this humor, it's not really for me. So when I saw that he was, you know, the author we, we were reading for this month, I thought, well, you know, I've, I've enjoyed some of his books, but I wondered if it was going to have some of his sense of humor that I didn't like as much. Um, but I really thought he did a good job with this and um, it was well done. Okay. And um, what did you think? Did you think this was like a typical Peter David style book? Um, yeah, I did. Now I had always, oh, I always enjoyed his books and, and I always liked his humor really. Um, so, Oh, yeah, but and I thought this was it was pretty typical, even though it's kind of reading it a second time. I don't think I enjoyed it as much as I did before, maybe because I was younger then or or some, some a few little things about the book I remembered. And maybe it's not as as good if you know what's going to happen. But um, but I think it, it was typical of his style. I think it did have his humor. And the way he does it is he he does a lot of character development and he's not as as technical, and I, I like that about his writing. So um, I thought it was pretty good. I, yeah, I no, do I, think. Oh, go ahead. Okay. I I mean I do think I, the thing I was wondering about is Tyler and Egma fell in love after what only being together like two days, and then thirty three years later they're still in love. And she yeah. she's willing to. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I thought really, I, I you know, 
she was ready to leave for him. Well, and because of the thinning, but also, but also because she was still in love with him. And for him to still be in love with her, like he never met anyone else in all this time, that that was a little strange. I mean, that was carrying it a little too far. But other than that, yeah. I thought he handled the characters well. Yeah, I thought that was a bit of a stretch, too, because I don't even know that they were together for two days. It, it almost seemed like when they met the first time that mm-hmm. it was like love at first sight. Like, oh, they saw each other and immediately within, a, you know, right away, they're only together a couple hours and they're all so in love. And I thought, hmm, yeah. Yeah, really? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then 35 years go past. Um, but, you know, um I still like the characters, and uh, I thought the uh, Caligar characters were all interesting. And, you know, you mentioned earlier about the fact that Ekma had ended up marrying her brother and had a son with him. Um, And there was a lot about, you know, Tyler and the people in the Enterprise thinking, oh, yeah, you know, she was forced to marry her brother. And she was like, well, you know, I wasn't really forced. And, you know, this isn't. Um, you know, in our culture, marrying your sibling is not a taboo, and it, it doesn't have uh, any negative genetic repercussions. Um, and and that you know that's been a theme on a lot of Star Trek episodes, as you know, looking at other cultures, whereas something that to us may be taboo or uh, normal to another culture is you know normal or taboo. So you know, the fact that things are different depending on where you're from and it really makes you think about your ideas um, and your beliefs and so that you know that was interesting Um, but getting back to the concept of thinning so we learn that the main reason that ECMA is fleeing is because um, and and I'll mention that I, I wonder when he if it was published in 91 he probably obviously wrote it earlier than 91 but it had a story that was very similar to a next generation episode that aired in 1991 um if you remember half a life yeah i was going to mention that yes yeah with david ogden's dyers um so i thought wow it's interesting you know this you know it came out right around the same time but basically because the people on Caligar can't live on their planet because they polluted it so badly and they're living in these domes or whatever you want to call them above the planet it has limited space Um, so you can't continually expand your population so when people get to be now in half a life case was you get to be a certain age you basically have to commit suicide Um, this was not a certain age but we learned that on Caligar uh, people are constantly being monitored and the world net um, is decides when a person's reached their peak productivity or peak creativity. Um, and after they've reached their peak, then they get thinned, which means that they, their physical body dies and their kind of consciousness is uploaded to the world net. And that's what we learned. The world net really is. It's, the consciousness of all the people you know that have been thinned um, and they're kind of making decisions and um, people who are still alive can consult them so ECMA learns that you know the world net has decided that she's uh, reached her peak creativity and productivity and it's time for her to be thinned and she doesn't want to be killed so that's why she's trying to flee So were you surprised to learn about the concept of thinning and that's why she was really fleeing? And what did you think about that? Yeah, that was surprising. Um, Well, she, she did say she was going to die at, you know, at first and then, and then it took a while, a few chapters in the book to find out why that it was actually that, that they wanted her to die because of the thinning. Yeah. That was like, that was a big shock. Like, Whoa, wait a minute. Um, yeah, and then we find out that that this these people are like that. That was, you know, that that's really something that's another cultural thing. Like, well, we we wouldn't be like that. But, but and but yeah, it was another idea that was already explored on on the next generation too. But but yeah, so 
that was um yeah that was pretty different and it was an interesting idea in this book that that that's what had to happen to her and then and then it's good that Kirk said well you know she asked asylum she asked us for asylum and we're going to give it to her i like that too yeah and it really put Kirk in a difficult position because um, you know, again, we have, like you said, the concept of this is her culture and, you know, maybe it's a taboo for us, but, you know, maybe we're being judgmental if we say, well, this is your, you know, this is their culture and it's wrong. Um, but ECMO wanted to leave. She didn't want to be thin. Um, and Kirk took a stand for her, which put him in a bad position because the Caligar were very angry about that. Um, and it, you know, could have caused a major uh, incident with the Federation um, with Kirk refusing to return ECMA against her will to the Caligar. So it was really, a, you know, a lot to think about uh, because you, you did have to think, wow, you know, part of you wants to say, well, they, why don't they just build more space if they have more people, you know? But in a way, when, when they die, when they're thin, in a way they're not actually dying, like Someone would, you know, like a human would, because their consciousness is being uploaded into uh, into the world net. Um, so she had even mentioned, like her, the the uh, the elders or the people of the ministry running the government, you know, consulted her father who had been thinned, but his consciousness was still there in the world net. Yeah, like in a sense, they really don't die. Their their mind or their consciousness still lives on. Yeah. So that was interesting. Um, so we won't, I don't want to, we've spoiled a lot here. We won't totally spoil what, what happens at the end. Um, but I really enjoyed it. Um, I really liked the, the Pikes part. And um, even though it was a different Pike than I was expecting or used to. Um, and I thought the concept was, was interesting. Um, touched on themes that we've seen in some other Star Trek episodes. Had some characters. And, you know, we briefly mentioned Dr. Daystrom. And one thing that I thought was interesting is um, when Captain Kirk goes down to talk to the Caligar, when um, he finds out about the thinning and he confronts them about it because they had been hiding that, um, you know, he says, how can you decide when someone's peak creativity or, you know, when they're past their prime is, you, you never know. I mean, Someone could go on, you know, being productive or creative many years into their life. And there's just no way to, to make that decision because you could make the decision and realize it's a mistake. He said, you know, who would want that? And Dr. Daystrom says, you know, I understand because that's I would want that because he felt at that point that he had achieved all he was going to achieve. He had reached his peak and everything was downhill from there. And. He just didn't really want to keep on living. He had had a mental breakdown, and he felt like his whole life was about, hey, remember that one great thing you did, and you're never going to ever achieve anything as good as that again? So he felt like a failure. So he kind of understood and why that people may want that. So that was interesting to bring him in and connect that like that. That is true. That sort of that that was a good use of him in the story, and that could have been the reason um, that Peter David wanted to put that the idea of the thinning in the book was to have Richard Daystrom and have uh, how he can relate to to people no longer being useful. That idea. Yeah. So, um, anything else that you want to add? Um, I just uh, want to say that macro. The, the character that was uh, Igma's brother and husband, he was the one that was so disagreeable. Like he was the antagonist through the whole story. And then the end, I won't give away the ending, but he just had he had a great journey in this book all the way to the end. It was so that was, um, you know, I thought a beautiful handling of his character. Yes, um, that the, the, Peter David did a great job with that because he is the antagonist. He's the guy you think this guy is kind of dull and not too bright and he's just a brute and you know just you just don't like him and he start he's saying things about another character who I won't reveal because that'll kind of give stuff away and then you realize at the end oh you know what 
I, maybe I've misjudged him. And, you know, some of the stuff he was saying about this other character is actually true. And, you, you know, but we were quick to judge and someone's, you know, acting kind of immature and brutish and kind of stupid in one instance makes you quick to not believe what they have to say or to think that maybe they could be right. And he did have a really interesting arc and turned out to be not exactly who you expected. Whereas another character, um, you know, related to this also kind of made some judgments about him. And he turned out to not be what you thought. So that was interesting. Mm-hmm. And I also so- will mention that... Um, I did read this time, I remembered to look in Voyages of Imagination to see what Peter David had to say about this book. And um, it was interesting that he said he had been asked, he had been he had written some next generation uh, novels, hadn't written any uh, original series ones because they just didn't have, they didn't need uh, anyone writing those at that time. So he was writing... Um, some next generation ones, and then they asked him to write an an original series. And he came up with three scripts, and he said one he thought was great, one he thought was okay, and then one he thought was really not good, and he said he had included three because he wanted to make the one he thought was great look good. And the one that they picked, which ended up being the riff, was actually the one he thought was not good. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe yeah. that explains a lot. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, you know, he had put it in there thinking, oh, yeah, I'll just have this crap submit this not so good idea so that they pick the one that I think is great. And they ended up picking it. But, uh, you know, I still thought it was pretty good. So. Yeah, it was still good. Um, yeah, mostly just the fact that, you know, as we talked about, about Fox having at, um, Ambassador Fox and Daystrom in it. And having the and having Tyler fall in love so quickly, I think those are the main problem points with it. But other than that, it I mean it was a good story. So he probably did a lot of work on it after after saying that it you know wasn't as good as the others. Yes, and the, and I do want to apologize to listeners that I have a cold, so I'm breathing out of my mouth, and so I probably sound like a heavy oh, breather. So. I didn't even notice. <laughs> And then the other thing is there is more that I did want to talk about, but something is wrong with my Kindle. And, I, you know, in Kindle you can highlight. So I highlighted different um, passages in here that I was going to talk about, different quotes and stuff. Um, and I cannot – the book will not open in Kindle now. It just It's blank when it opens, and I've tried to – Oh, no. Well. So I don't know. It's on the cloud somewhere. I mean, to reboot the Kindle or redo it, but – um, but I think we covered it pretty well anyway, even though I can't remember what it was that I highlighted. Um, so I'm going to say, like, I would give this, um, like, three, three and a half out of five quadlus. What about you? Um, I was going to say the same thing, three and a half out of five, um, just because it was, you know, it was good, but it had some problems. But I think I, I would recommend it, though, because I think it, it is a good enough, you know, entertaining enough book to enjoy. Okay, and I guess we'll sign off now. Thanks, Jen. Thanks for listening. Make sure you hit that subscribe button and join our Facebook group. Live long and may the force be with you. Nanu Nanu.